Hello and welcome to the next Kubernetes tutorial video. So in this video, I want to give you an overview of the most basic fundamental components of Kubernetes, uh, but just enough to actually get you started using Kubernetes in practice, either as a DevOps engineer or a software developer. Now, Kubernetes has tons of components, but most of the time you're going to be working with just a handful of them. So if you have just 30 to 40 minutes and you want to get started with Kubernetes as fast as possible, this video can actually be the perfect fit for you. So I'm going to build a case of a simple JavaScript application with a simple database, and I'm going to show you step by step how each component of Kubernetes actually helps you to deploy your application and what is the role of each of those components. So let's start with the basic setup of a, a worker node or in Kubernetes terms, a node, which is a simple server, a physical or virtual machine. And the basic component or the smallest unit of Kubernetes is a pod. So what pod is, is basically an abstraction over a container. So if you're familiar with Docker containers, or container images. So basically what pod does is it creates this running environment or a layer on top of the container. And the reason is because Kubernetes wants to abstract away the container runtime or container technologies so that you can replace them if you want to. And also because you don't have to directly uh, work with Docker or whatever container technology uh, you use in a Kubernetes. So you only interact with a Kubernetes layer. So we have an application pod, which is our own application, and that will maybe use a database pod with its own container. And this is also an important concept here. Pod is usually meant to run one application container inside of it. You can run multiple containers inside one pod, but usually it's only the case if you have one main application container and a helper container or some side service that has to run inside of that pod. And as you see, this is nothing special. You just have one server and two containers running on it with a abstraction layer on top of it. So now let's see how they communicate with each other in Kubernetes world. So Kubernetes offers out of the box a virtual network, which means that each pod gets its own IP address not the container, the pod gets the IP address and each pod can communicate with each other using that IP address, which is an internal IP address. Obviously it's not the uh, public one. So my application container can communicate with database using the IP address. However, pod components in Kubernetes, also an important concept are ephemeral, which means that they can die very easily. And when that happens, for example, if I lose a database container because the container crashed because the application crashed inside or because the node, the server that I'm running them on uh, ran out of resources, the pod will die and a new one will get created in its place. And when that happens, it will get assigned a new IP address which obviously is inconvenient if you are communicating with the database using the IP address because now you have to adjust it every time a pod restarts. And because of that, another component of Kubernetes called service is used. So service is basically a static IP address or permanent IP address that can be attached, so to say, to each pod. So my app will have its own service and database pod will have its own service. And the good thing here is that the life cycles of service and the pod are not connected. So even if the pod dies, the service and its IP address will stay. So you don't have to change that endpoint anymore. So now obviously you would want your application to be accessible through a browser, right? And for this, you would have to create an external service. So external service is a service that opens the communication from external sources. But obviously you wouldn't want your database to be open to the public requests. And for that, you would create something called an internal service. So this is a type of a service that you specify when creating one. However, if you notice the URL of 
the external service is not very practical. So basically what you have is uh, an HTTP protocol with a node IP address, so of the node, not the service, and the port number of the service, which is good for test purposes if you want to test something very fast, but not for the end product. So usually you would want your URL to look like this if you want to talk to your application with a secure protocol and a domain name. And for that, there is another component of Kubernetes called ingress. So instead of service, the request goes first to ingress and it does the forwarding then to the service. So now we saw some of the very basic components of Kubernetes. Um, and as you see, this is a very simple setup. We just have a one server um, and a couple of containers running and some services. Nothing really special where Kubernetes advantages or the actual cool features really uh, come forward, but we're going to get there step by step. So let's continue. So as we said, pods communicate with each other using a service. So my application will have a database endpoint, let's say called MongoDB service that it uses to communicate with the database. But where do you configure usually this database URL or endpoint? Usually you would do it in application um, properties file or um, as some kind of external environmental variable, but usually it's inside of the built image of the application. So for example, if the endpoint of the service or service name in this case changed to MongoDB, you would have to adjust that URL in the application. So usually you'd have to rebuild the application with a new version and you have to push it to the repository and now you'll have to pull that new image in your pod and restart the whole thing. So a little bit tedious for a small change like database URL. So for that purpose, Kubernetes has a component called config map. So what it does is it's basically your external configuration to your application. So config map would usually contain configuration data like URLs of a database or some other services that you use. And in Kubernetes, you just connect it to the pod so that pod actually gets the data that config map contains. And now if you change the name of the service, the endpoint of the service, you just adjust the config map and that's it. You don't have to build a new image. You don't have to go through this whole cycle. Now, part of the external configuration can also be database username and password, right? Which may also change in the application deployment process, but putting a password or other credentials in a config map in a plain text format would be insecure, even though it's an external configuration. So for this purpose, Kubernetes has another component called secret. So secret is just like config map, but the difference is that it's used to store secret data credentials, for example, and it's stored not in a plain text format, of course, but in base 64 encoded format. So secret would contain things like credentials. And of course, I mean, database user, you could also put in config map, but what's important is the passwords, certificates, things that you don't want other people to have access to would go in the secret. And just like config map, you just connect it to your pod so that pod can actually see those data and read from the secret. You can actually use the data from config map or secret inside of your application pod using, for example, environmental variables or even as a properties file. So now to review, we've actually looked at almost all mostly used Kubernetes basic components. We've looked at the pod. We've seen how services are used, what is ingress component useful for, and we've also seen external configuration using config map and secrets. So now let's see another very important concept generally, which is data storage and how it works in Kubernetes. So we have this database pod that our application uses and it has some data or it generates some data. With this setup that you see now, if the database container or the pod gets restarted, the data would be gone. And that's problematic and inconvenient, obviously, because you want your database data or log data to be persisted reliably long-term. 
And the way you can do it in Kubernetes is using another component of Kubernetes called volumes. And how it works is that it basically attaches a physical storage on a hard drive to your pod. And that storage could be either on a local machine, meaning on the same server node where the pod is running, or it could be on a remote storage, meaning outside of the Kubernetes cluster. It could be a cloud storage or it could be your own premise storage, which is not part of the Kubernetes cluster. So you just have an external reference on it. So now when the database pod or container gets restarted, all the data will be there, persisted. And because data storage and volumes is a very important topic, I'm going to make its own tutorial video about volumes. But now it's important to understand the distinction between the Kubernetes cluster and all of its components and the storage. Regardless of whether it's a local or remote storage, think of a storage as an external hard drive plugged in into the Kubernetes cluster. Because the point is Kubernetes cluster explicitly doesn't manage any data persistence, which means that you as a Kubernetes user or an administrator are responsible for backing up the data, replicating and managing it and making sure that it's kept on a proper hardware, etc. Because it's not taking care of Kubernetes. So now let's see everything is running perfectly and a user can access our application through a browser. Now with this setup, what happens if my application pod dies, right? Crashes or I have to restart the pod because I built a new uh, container image. Basically, I would have a downtime where a user can reach my application, which is obviously a very bad thing if it happens in production. And this is exactly the advantage of distributed systems and containers. So instead of relying on just one application pod and one database pod, etc., we are replicating everything on multiple servers. So we would have another node where a replica or clone of our application would run, which will also be connected to the service. So remember previously we said the service is like an persistent static IP address with a DNS name so that you don't have to constantly adjust the endpoint when a pod dies. But service is also a load balancer, which means that the service will actually catch the request and forward it to whichever pod is least busy. So it has both of these functionalities. But in order to create the this second replica of the my application pod, you wouldn't create a second pod but instead you would define a blueprint for a my application pod and specify how many replicas of that pod you would like to run. And that component or that blueprint is called deployment, which is another component of Kubernetes. And in practice, you would not be working with pods or you would not be creating pods. You would be creating deployments because there you can specify how many replicas and you can also scale up or scale down number of replicas of pods that you need. So with pod, we said that pod is a layer of abstraction on top of containers and deployment is another abstraction on top of pods, which makes it more convenient to interact with the pods, replicate them and do some other configuration. So in practice, you would mostly work with deployments and not with pods. So now if one of the replicas of your application pod would die, the service will forward the requests to another one. So your application would still be accessible for the user. So now you're probably wondering what about the database pod? Because if the database pod died, your application also wouldn't be accessible. So we need a database replica as well. However, we can't replicate database using a deployment. And the reason for that is because database has a state, which is its data, meaning that if we have clones or replicas of the database, they would all need to access the same shared data storage. And there you would need some kind of mechanism that manages which pods are currently writing to that storage or which pods are reading from that storage in order to avoid data inconsistencies. And that mechanism 
in addition to replicating feature is offered by another Kubernetes component called stateful set. So this component is meant specifically for applications like databases. So MySQL, MongoDB, Elasticsearch, or any other stateful applications or databases should be created using stateful sets and not deployments. It's a very important distinction. And stateful set, just like deployment, would take care of replicating the pods and scaling them up or scaling them down, but making sure that database reads and writes are synchronized so that no database inconsistencies are offered. However, I must mention here that deploying database applications using stateful set in Kubernetes cluster can be somewhat tedious. So it's definitely more difficult than working with deployments where you don't have all these challenges. That's why it's also a common practice to host database uh, applications outside of the Kubernetes cluster and just have the deployments or stateless applications that replicate and scale with no problem inside of the Kubernetes cluster and communicate with the external database. So I'm gonna make another video in order to show specific comparison between deployment and stateful set and how to actually deploy database applications properly in a Kubernetes cluster. So now that we have two replicas of my application pod and two replicas of the database and they're both load balanced, our setup is more robust, which means that now even if node one, the whole node server was actually rebooted or crashed and nothing could run on it, we would still have a second node with application and database pods running on it and the application would still be accessible by the user until these two replicas get recreated. So you can avoid downtime. So to summarize, we have looked at the most used Kubernetes components. We start with the pods and the services in order to communicate between the pods and the ingress component, which is used to route traffic into the cluster. We've also looked at external configuration using config maps and secrets and data persistence using volumes. And finally, we've looked at pod blueprints with replicating mechanisms like deployments and stateful sets, where stateful set is used specifically for stateful applications like databases. And yes, there are a lot more components that Kubernetes offers, but these are really the core, the basic ones. Just using these core components, you can actually build pretty powerful Kubernetes clusters. Thanks for watching the video. I hope it was helpful. And if it was, don't forget to like it. This is a video series, so I will create a new one every week. So if you want to be notified whenever a new video comes out, then subscribe to my channel. Um, if you have any questions, if something wasn't clear in the video, please post them in the comment section below and I will try to answer them. So thank you and see you in the next video.